Well, hello there. Here we are again. How is this connection? Everything good? Let's hope so. All right. Hello, welcome to Cerebrophile with me, Miss Raz, and my big hands. Today, instead of doing a drawing of some sort, I am going to give this lovely brain a little makeover. So, this lovely little piece here I found on Amazon and my lovely boyfriend gifted to me for my birthday. It is, I'm assuming to scale, should be about to scale. It's about that size. Ooh, even the right hemisphere is larger. Is that the way it normally is? I think it's the left. Anyway, so it came sort of painted. There's some veins here. And then they made the cerebellum green for whatever reason. Oh, here are some arteries, I'm guessing, with the crappy little screw. I was going to take that off anyway. Maybe I'll put it back on. We'll see. I don't know. So yeah, green cerebellum, which is kind of funny. And then, so it opens a few different ways, which is really cool. I'll just show one side. So here is our beautiful sagittal cut. That's the long ways all the way down. And uh, I don't know what is going on there. I don't know if you can fully appreciate that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's like painted with white of some sort. And then we have again some more of these silly little veins. And we also see here some of these little maggots that hold the whole thing together, which is pretty cool that I can take it apart and show you all the areas of the brain that I am talking about sometimes. Now let's see, what else can we remove here? So you can also take off this piece, which I think is so fun. So here we have mostly our frontal lobe. Here we have that side. We have our temporal lobe. So this would be like right here, basically. All right, now let's see here. This is also fun. I like this a lot too. We can see they somebody painted it with white water or something. But here, it'll be much more obvious when I paint this. This thin, thin little layer here, which is called the gray matter, that's where the real thinky thinky bits are. And there, I'm going to definitely draw that, paint that in a little bit darker so you can see it. The rest of it, I think that's why they painted it white. The rest of it here, this bigger area, is the white matter. And that's where all of our wonderful axons are that actually relay all the information. All right. Now the other thing we have here, let's take this piece off, the rest of the cerebellum. I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to bust out my anatomy book for reference while I do this. Uh, so yeah, here's the rest of, this is the temporal lobe right here, put those down, and this would be the occipital lobe right back here. This is where you can see things, or this is what helps you identify things and process vision. All right, just put that over there, and the last couple bits we're left with here, let me yank the other bit out of the other side, out of here. Okay. A little bit of a puzzle here. There we go. Okay. Now this interesting looking thing, well these back here, cerebellum, this is what kind of controls movement, but oddly enough you can live without a cerebellum. So a lot of neuro people don't really care too much about this, so put that aside for a sec. It's important, we'll talk more about it in the future. And this lovely structure here, put that down like that, this is the brainstem. Well, this part is at least. And this all up in here is our limbic system. And there's a lot of pieces that, pieces and parts that are in there. So this is just a very broad overview. And again, if we cut it open, we can see the beautiful sagittal cut. So we have a few different pieces to play with here. Look at that. This is just... Well, I was going to say it's just one half of the brain, but we have both cerebellums and both sides of the brainstem. Then we have a couple more pieces here. Just brain parts everywhere. Isn't that the greatest thing ever? Who doesn't just want a bunch of brain pieces? You know, I 
should have. I was going to look for some royalty free music, but I guess that's not it. Oh, it also came with this thing where you can like sit the brain in, which is all well and good, but I don't really like it. If anything, I want somehow a little stand that goes right here that would hold the brain. So we'll see. Just put that aside for right now. Okay. Where do I begin? Since I'm not quite sure how to paint all of that good stuff, I'm going to start with just the, all the lobes. Oh, look at that. Isn't that awesome? I love that. I will put a link somewhere, maybe, I hope, uh, where to find this on Amazon. This is only 50 some odd dollars as opposed to most, uh, really any sort of anatomy models that are proper anatomy models. They're like two and three and four hundred dollars. They're absurd. I would love to get a really fancy one one day, but no time soon. Okay, let's start with our, we have here, we have our, is this the way it goes? Yeah. Our frontal lobe here, parietal, and a tiny bit of the occipital lobe, I guess you could say. So, I have my paints right here. We have some white, some yellow. I don't know their proper names. I'm sorry. I'm not not like the wonderful Bob Ross. The white, yellow, some pink, some red, some magenta purple, a darker purple, and a dark uh, brown. So I have my trusty little napkin here and some water. Always with the nostrils. Okay. So, I don't hate the color that it is now. I actually quite like it, but the only way to get rid of these these real red paint lines, which I do not love, is to paint over it. I'm a little nervous, but anything is really an improvement. I mean, what is it? See, this is me second guessing myself and getting nervous. I'm worried some of those lines might show. We'll find out. So let's mix up some sort of fleshy brain color. Oh, I need to make enough of it to do the whole thing. Let's see. I don't know if it's interesting to people to watch me mix colors. Oh my gosh. I'll bring this in here for a second. Oh. This is some leftover piece of plastic from I think a piece of jewelry that my mother bought in Amsterdam years ago. Fleshy, fleshy. Let's get that fleshy color. So as I've mentioned in other, my other videos, <laughs> uh, in anatomy books, they take a lot of liberties with the colors that they paint things, like the way that they painted uh, the cerebellum green here. It's really just to differentiate it more than anything. The cerebellum is most certainly not green. <laughs> And, you know, veins aren't bright blue and things like that. So I might take a couple of those liberties too. I might paint the cerebellum like maybe like a dark purple. That's what I've done in the past. So we'll see. I'm looking at a reference that I painted over there too. All right. We have this fleshy color. It's not fleshy at all. My goodness, that is white. All right. Let's scoop that aside. a little nervous but it's gonna be fine let's just let's just go for it okay that's making a kind of a funny gray color <laughs> gonna have to be a couple layers here but that's okay oh, good it's covering up the veins pretty well which I want I'm gonna add my own veins maybe later vascular system. Oh. Yeah, what if uh, while I'm doing this, as I'm painting over parts, maybe I explain uh, what would happen if you poked those parts in real life. Okay, so let me keep oriented here. Uh, this is the front part, so it's like this basically in your head. Uh, oh, I need to keep my own head out of the frame. That would be good. So this front part is the part that we would really consider the thinky thinky bits that really set us apart from 
whatever, if I get paint on here, it's fine. The thinky thinky bits that really differentiate us from other animals. That's what at least we like to think, right? Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the frontal lobe. What's really interesting, I, I think, about the frontal lobe is that it's it's kind of, again, the area that makes us more human. So think of some things that make us human aside from us talking and things like that. Like certain behaviors, like inhibiting behavior. I know that seems weird. Like why would inhibiting a behavior be such an important behavior? Well, think about how a dog has a really hard time. Like if there's food dropped on the floor, it's not thinking like, oh, I shouldn't eat that. You know, mom and dad probably want that piece of food. Like it's just going to go for it. And same with like babies and younger younger adults. We lack the ability to inhibit our initial want and urge. So we just go and grab that cookie out of someone else's hand when that's not nice. <laughs> that's not your cookie. And as we get older, we of course learn to think about other people too and realize that, oh, well, if I were to take their cookie, that would probably make them feel bad and sad. And I wouldn't want someone to take my cookie. So we learn to inhibit maybe some of our initial actions or behaviors that we want to do. So that happens or that kind of thing, that development is mostly in this frontal lobe area. And what's again, the really interesting part, the buildup that does not fully develop or like kind of reach its end of development until like, I think early twenties. <laughs> so, it's partially also what, I mean, it explains a little bit of why younger people, especially, you know, high school students <laughs> act a little bit crazier and take a lot more risks and do these kind of things and have some impulse control sometimes. Seems that some people never develop this part of their brain, never learn to inhibit themselves. There's a lot of people on the internet who don't know how to inhibit their horrible I don't know, comments and stuff. Please be nice to people out there. Come on. All right, so that is the frontal lobe, and it does a lot of other things too. And has also susceptible to some things like a frontal lobe dementia. Uh, is that the one that happens here? I'm not an expert in neuroscience, I just particularly like it. Uh, it's a type of dementia. There, dementia is a very general word for you know, kind of becoming forgetful, not being able to do certain things you used to be able to do, forgetting things, all that kind of stuff. Uh, dementia is a blanket term, like when you don't know where or, or why that's happening, you just say dementia. Uh, but one of the types of dementia that most people are very familiar with is Alzheimer's, and that has to do with those amyloid, amyloid plaques. Basically, like your brain gets filled with like gunky bits that shouldn't be there and the brain starts to kind of atrophy. I'll do a drawing of that one day. It's, it's, in, I mean, it's really sad, but it's incredible that the brain just kind of, kind of shrinks. Uh, but frontal lobe dementia is another type of dementia that affects this front part over here. Uh, I can't remember exactly why, but there are some degradation in that area. And yeah, you, certain things happen. So what would happen if you think about it? Do we know that the frontal lobe, for example, is a part of inhibition? So what do you think would happen if you had damage to your frontal lobe? Well, yeah, you might lose the ability to inhibit some stuff. So I've read some fun, fun case studies of people who develop frontal lobe dementia. And one was a woman who, perfectly nice lady otherwise, but as she got further and further into her dementia, she uh, became much more impulsive. She started gambling. She also started cussing, <laughs> which her family was like, oh my gosh, she never used to do that. So those are some of the things that could happen with frontal lobe damage. There's a myriad of other things. There's so many, so many other things, but this is just a quick little overview, just a preface to all the other videos that I will hopefully make here one day. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna let this dry a bit. Scoot you over. Okay. Another napkin here. Let's 
do this other side before I run out of paint because I'm almost out of the color. <laughs> Not good. You should always make enough of your paint because it's really hard to make that exact same color again. I'm telling you. I'm telling you so you don't repeat my mistake. So I've already talked about the frontal lobe. Let's scoot a little. Actually, this doesn't even have. I'm kind of missing that main sulci, sulcis, sulci, 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 sulci. I forget which one's plural, if either of those are plural. Um, but the sulci, you can think of it as the sinking or the sunken parts, and that's the little dips, and the gyri or gyri, however you like to say it, are the actual little. Anyway, so there's usually a kind of a definitive one here, I thought, but. It's fine, let's pretend it's there. So again, here's our frontal lobe. This is the front, so your eyeballs would be over here somewhere. And this is the, am I looking at the right side? Yes, this is the right side of the brain. And so, well right now I'm still painting the frontal lobe. In just a second here, get over to the next lobe I wanna discuss. All of those nooks and crannies, salsa and gyri. Okay. My hand is already hurting. Good lord. Never get old. Okay. So now if we scoot back just a little bit. Kind of. Uh oh. That. How did that red get in there? Where did that come from? Oh well. We're adding variation. You can barely even tell in the video because things are overexposed as any youtuber videographer photographer knows overexposed things it makes things look nicer at least as far as skin and things like that go anyway so this part here kind of like from here to about here i think ish that is our parietal lobe i need to look up what that means again why is it called that whenever you have to learn if any of you are studying anatomy or or really anything in life. If you're trying to study and learn a new word, look up its origin. Go on Google and just say parietal origin. Usually the first little drop down on wiki will usually tell you the root of the word and it'll give you a little bit more information about what that word means, such as the word temporal lobe, which we'll get to in a little bit here. But so our parietal lobe is, it's one of my favorite, I mean they're all my favorites in a sense, but I really like the parietal lobe. Because that is the, that contains the somatosensory cortex. So what does that mean, somatosensory? So no, basically, if I have my hand here and I go boop, and I touch it, I can feel it, right? Somebody else touches you, you feel it. And there is a part of your brain here, I forget what, which one is in front. One is about feeling, one is about action. So I think the feeling one's in front. I forget. Maybe if I edit this video, I'll put the correct thing here. So one part of that parietal lobe is responsible for basically feeling and sensing things and then uh, in your body, whether that be touch or also there's other types of senses. Oh, that's a good video to do. The different senses. Most people think we have five senses. There are more. Uh, but then the other part of the parietal lobe, the other important thing is the part that actually allows you to move and there are motor areas there that so i was just touching my hand here and i was talking about the touch that my right or left hand is feeling but my right hand is the one who did the action right and i made it move so parietal lobe as a very oversimplification generalization and again i don't even know if i'm getting all the bits and bobs right uh, is the part of your brain that controls movement and sensation. Eh. Eh. Why do I hold you? There we go. Oh gosh, did I paint the inside of the other one? I'm going to need more paint. <laughs> For the first time in I don't know how many years, I actually went to Michael's today and purchased some paint. 
Oh, I didn't even finish that other side. Ugh. I'm gonna used to always be buying paint, but then once I finally got my stock and collection up enough, you know, paint takes a while to use if you're not painting much. I still, I used to paint a lot with acrylic, and I still, I've lived in this. Uh, Tragedy. <laughs> what do I do with this? Oh no! I hate when this happens. Let's clean that up or else I'll get it all over me. Ugh. It's gonna look like I injured my pinky. I did not. Everything is fine. Thank you for your concern. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get more paint now. Wow, I'm in this moment. Excuse me. Got more of that pink. Pink was a good investment. I think I have enough yellow. I also bought a brand new titanium white. It's my old one was so so dried out and it's hard to manage. Okay. Oh, I hope I don't get dirty. I like this top, but I want to look cute when I film. Okay. Back to my brain. Oh wait, no. First, I have to mix up my color again. I'm gonna move that red aside. All right. Just scooch a bunch of that white over. Mix them up. I need one of those little spatulas that Bob Ross would use. Ah, oh, I love Bob Ross. I petition that we canonize him. I don't know if he was Catholic or anything, but just a national treasure. International treasure. Oh my goodness gracious. Well, I should have enough now. <laughs> Nice pinky fleshy brain color. So I say that is a different color, but it's okay because we're gonna paint over the whole thing and hopefully we have enough. Okay. So what else do we have in this brain here? Let me scoot. Get to center myself. Get in frame, girl. Ah. Okay. So the inside here. I'll have to paint this a little bit more later too to just give it more emphasis. This right here, this like long thing, I mean in reality it's connected, oh my gosh I'm getting paint everywhere. In reality it's connected to the other side of the brain and it's called the corpus callosum. And corpus means body, not corpse. And callosum, think of like colosseum, which, and colossus, the colossal squid. It means big. So it literally translates to big body. And it connects both sides of the brain to communicate with each other. And once again, like the weird cerebellum, it is possible to live with a split brain. Like they've had to sometimes cut that connection, especially for people with um, epilepsy is usually the reason. Because if you start a seizure on one side of your brain, like maybe over here, but then it travels through the corpus callosum to the other side of the brain, and that's going to be a really big seizure. And that is not good, and it's very dangerous. I think a lot of people f assume that epilepsy, except for those people who know somebody with epilepsy probably, I think a lot of people assume that epilepsy is handled, we, we got it, it's not going to kill you, it most certainly can. Uh, Plenty of people, I don't have a number, again, if I edit this video, I'll put the number here. Uh, that many people have passed away from epilepsy in a given year. It is still a big, scary, dangerous kind of problem or disease disorder. And one of these days I'll do a whole video on how doctors try to go in there and try to fix these things with things called like depth electrodes and resections and things like that. Okay, almost done with this half, and I'll put it aside and grab the other half again. 
Actually, I should probably paint the next section. Oh, I didn't get to talk about the occipital lobe. I'll come back to it. Let's put this. <laughs> Go. Put that aside. Okay, let's pull out these two little buddies. Oh, there is some occipital lobe on this. Great. Okay, so here, this is kind of hard to tell what's going on here. This would be like, this is a, this is not a big enough brain, but this would be the front of your brain, the temporal lobe coming forward, but like kind of lower around here. And then we have our occipital lobe back here. So what do these things do? This is how it would sit facing on your brain. These are very interesting. So actually let's do the occipital lobe. I should sit, do the occipital lobe. So this back here, I would say about all this part and then some this is called the occipital lobe and occipital has to do with vision so this it's actually as far as the whole to the surface area and land mass area of your brain goes the occipital lobe i think is the largest lobe in your brain so basically we devote a lot of our brain's processing power and abilities and such to vision, which makes sense. We are very, very visual creatures. That's not to say though, that it's, on, its only use could be for vision because there are people who of course are blind. So what, is this whole part of the brain just gonna not work? No, absolutely not. The brain will find something to do with it and will recruit it in other things such as making it even, making you even more um, receptive to touch things or sound things. So brain and the body are amazing at compensating for things sometimes. So, ah. Get up under here. I should just paint everything one flat color and then go back later. So I just don't have to worry about it. Oh dear, it's fine. All right, almost there. Anybody out there ever eaten brain? It's a delicacy in some places. I've seen some people cook it before and I have to admit the texture of it interests me. And I'm very weird about textures in my food, but that texture looks fun. Uh, but if you ever do eat brain, please be very careful and restrict it to, honestly, you probably shouldn't be eating any brains. Uh, brains, here's some more fun random facts. If you eat a brain of a human, certain types of humans who have a certain type of, uh, is it an infection? Prion diseases. This is a really weird type of disease thing that not a, I mean, we still don't have a complete handle on it. But it has to do with like these proteins that you can't really kill the same way you can a virus. And like one protein is like, I'm gonna fold this way. Because proteins have a very specific folding pattern. That's what usually gives, it's part of what gives them their function. But uh, some of them decide, I'm gonna fold like this. And they, once they start doing that, they recruit others to fold in the same way. And, uh, yeah, that happens in your brain. If you eat somebody's brain who has prion disease, it's a good chance that you eventually will get it too, and it is not pretty. Remember the, maybe some of you remember the scare of mad cow disease? So the human version, or one of them, was called Koro? Kuro? Koro, I think. It was this indigenous tribe. I can't remember where now, though. And they would, as part of their 
ritual, death ritual, and do not judge other people's death rituals, okay? Different cultures, they would, to honor the person, actually eat their flesh. And one of the things they would eat was the brain. And this particular tribe kept developing, many of their uh, members kept developing this really strange disorder where they would, I think they would just be laughing a lot and would sweat and eventually they would die from this disorder. It's very unpleasant. And you can't sleep, I think, is another thing. Uh, very unpleasant. So that can happen when you eat brains. And it also, like, mad cow disease was spread because cows were being fed other cows, basically, um, like leftover cow bits, including brain bits. They were being fed that. And that's how some of them ended up getting uh, what we call the bovine spongy form something or another. Mad cow disease. Anyway, so, I don't know how I got onto eating brains. Don't, don't eat brains. Let's just kind of use that as our general rule. I think there's also something if you eat bat brains. I don't remember what it is though, but yeah, just be careful what kind of weird things that you try out there. Okay, so the last very exciting lobe. Is there a bone? Not a lobe, right? I don't think so. So another ex exciting, very exciting lobe, and I waited till I was holding the left one in my hand. This is the left temporal lobe over here. And now it's not true for every single person. Some people have it on the right side, but most people who are right-handed, because most people are right-handed, on the left temporal lobe, they have a lot of their taki-taki abilities. We have areas called Wernicke's area and Broca's area, and these kind, these areas are responsible for uh, receptive language, meaning being able to understand the words that I'm saying to you right now as I talk. And then there's also expressive language. So as I come up with these words, there's a part of my brain coming up with those words. And man, when you get damaged in one of those areas, we're gonna talk, there's gonna be a whole video on that, different types of aphasias and the different ways that communication can break down. It's just, there's so many places. I mean, it's true for a lot of things in the brain. If you can't, if you have trouble seeing in different ways, there's so many different places that that can break and where you could have a problem and the, depending on where it breaks, of course that ooh, changes how it actually manifests and what it will look like or how it will be uh, presented. I think that's what doctors say. We came in presenting with blah, blah, blah. I think another thing I'd like to do on this little channel here of mine is take scientific research articles which are written very jargony and kind of translate them, maybe in a funny way. Sometimes it'll be like, the patient suffered a severe ischemic event after a severe uh, myocardial infraction, or something like that. And what they're basically saying is, the guy had a stroke after a big old heart attack. And it might be fun to translate that. I don't know if anybody's interested or cares. Oh, you know, I expected to get paint on my little thing here. It's fine. It's fine. Alright, and then in here, this is pretty cool, they like have the molded part of this, which we'll get to in a moment here. And honestly, of all the parts of the brain, the one that I am least familiar with that I really do need to learn more about is the limbic system, which is part of, or the brain system, is part of that thing I just showed you. And that's all the stuff right in the middle of the brain. And kind of the further or deeper into a brain you go, like this, the more primitive the brain kind of gets. Like that means that other animals will have very similar structures too. But uh, some of our parts of our brain are more specific to us. Like, I mean, many animals, mammals have cerebellums and stuff, but here's a fun fact. All those little wrinkles, sulcis and gyrides, I mean, the more those wrinkles basically means you have a big sheet of thinky thinky parts, right? And it was just so big that we had to fold it and compact it so we could shove as much of it into our brain skull thingy as possible. So animals, 
that are not humans have different, uh, I guess, varying degrees of how wrinkly their brains are. Does anybody have a guess as to which of all the mammals has the smoothest brain? It's kind of a funny insult. You're such a smooth brain. Yeah, so the smoothest brain out there, apparently for its size and everything, is that of the oh-so-mighty koala. They have quite a smooth brain. So if you ever want to low-key, I was going to say low-key insult somebody, but you shouldn't do that. But you could call them a koala. <laughs> And they'll just be like, oh, I'm a cute little endangered dumb thing. Yes. Those poor things. And apparently, if you were to, I think they eat, they eat eucalyptus. And they pick it off of the eucalyptus tree. And it's not very nutritious, so they have to spend all day eating it. Same with those darn pandas. And uh, apparently, if you just put a plate of those eucalyptus leaves in front of it. So it's like, look, it's already pre-plucked. You can just eat them. Won't know what to do with it. It needs to do, which is interesting, it needs to do that kind of fixed action pattern there of plucking the leaves off to know that, okay, that's my food. Which seems silly, but yeah. The animals, man, some evolve more than others. And some get left behind. Oh, I'm nervous <laughs> as to how I'm painting this. I always start off painting really excited and then like within the first 15 minutes, actually I've been doing this longer than that, haven't I? I have no idea. Oh, 37 minutes, my goodness. Yeah, after the first 37 minutes, I already start going, uh, what have I gotten myself into? Why did I start doing this? But it's fine, it'll... Get done. Oh, it's starting to get hot in here. <laughs> oh, so there's limbic system stuff here. As I mentioned, I am not... Are those little squiggly lines supposed to be? As I mentioned, I'm not proficient in this area, but a couple of the things that it does that are very important, or some of the structures it has in it are like the hippocampus, which is this thingy right here, sort of. Yes, I think that's the hippocampus. Or maybe the hippocampus is like inside of that. Anyway, there's a thing called the hippocampus and it's very, very important for making memories. If you have damage to that, you might have trouble making new memories. We also have the thalamus. And the thalamus is, again, one of the kind of like older parts of the brain that is kind of like a relay station for a lot of the stuff that comes from the body that goes up to the brain and vice versa. Uh, what else do we have in here? There's an amygdala in here somewhere, and the amygdala controls, or some would say amygdala, which I like, uh, controls emotions. So if you have damage to your amygdala, you might not be able to feel any fear, which sounds like a good thing, but fear is something important. There's also disorders or diseases that uh, people do not perceive pain, so they bump themselves don't notice it at all and just carry on. And again, it sounds like it'd be a great thing, right? It's very much not. People who have that will, you know, hurt themselves in various ways, like on accident. Like maybe they'll break a leg, but they won't feel any pain, so they don't know to stop and or they get a cut and then just start bleeding, don't realize that they're bleeding because it doesn't hurt. So that's a very interesting type of disorder. Should talk about that one day too. All right. Last silly bits here, Ugh, this green. Actually, I might, I'll paint these later because I'm gonna paint those like a purple color. Okay, come back. All these lovely pieces of brain. Delicious. Let's put the wetter ones over here. Okay. Oops, I forgot to do this part. And I think this is where I'm going to 
time lapse this? How does this work? I can download videos off of YouTube, right? I should check that real quick. Because one thing I've noticed about streaming or filming things is that when I am doing a craft like this, before I realized that, as my student would say, everything is content, and I started recording everything, I used to just watch something on YouTube and kind of chill. But now, I can't do that. Why? Copyright infringement. <laughs> and, yeah, don't want that in the background. Okay, I'm going to check that real quick. Since nobody's here. <laughs> uh, let's see here. More videos. I don't know anything about anything. Okay, you can download. Okay, I think now I'm going to kind of be quiet <laughs> and listen to Simply Pod Logical talk about their childhood injuries and such. I could also put these in front of the dryer, really help them get where I need them to get. What say you all? Okay. I will Keep streaming and just edit it later. Okay. You can listen to Ben and Christine again. TV, I see it on posters, I see it every time we drive. And so I just believed that you shouldn't drink a beverage. Any beverage. Any beverage. <laughs> Water, <laughs> coffee. Whatever it is, you shouldn't drink and drive because it's distracting, obviously, to pick up something while you're trying to drive. Yeah. I mean, it sounds silly, but like, I think I was just ahead of my game. Like, I was pretty smart there. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so for, I swear, what feels like years of my childhood, I thought those were the rules. So one day I'm with my, my grandpa, and we stopped at Tim Hortons. Very Canadian. Canadian. And he gets a coffee, and we go back and sit in the car, and he opens it. We start to drive, and then he goes to pick it up as he's driving. Uh -huh. And, and I, I, I just look at him in shock, and I'm upset. And he goes, what's wrong, Chrissy? <laughs> and I'm like, you're not supposed to drink and drive. And he just starts laughing, like bursting out laughing at me. He doesn't even explain, first of all. So, so I'm there, like, feeling like he's breaking the law. And should I do something? Should I call someone? Is he in trouble? Am I in trouble? He's a criminal. <laughs> he, he doesn't say anything. He just keeps laughing until we're eventually there. And I don't really remember how this concluded, but I think I asked a friend or someone, like, someone later when I felt like less embarrassed because I felt I felt embarrassed in that situation, <laughs> but I didn't know why. And then I learned it meant alcohol, and then I had to ask, what is alcohol? Uh -oh. And that's when I learned what alcohol is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, I find that so interesting that messages that are all around you as kids, even yeah. though you may not understand the meaning, you can in really internalize them if they're sure. constantly like said to you. Yeah. So what does that mean for TikTok kids, right? <laughs> or, or any messages, <laughs> any messages sure. that you may be hearing, words you, you think you understand, but there's another meaning that you don't have the capacity as a six-year-old to understand of drinking and driving. I, I don't know what that is yet, right? And no one was explaining it to me because... I'm nowhere near driving or... Well, it's funny that no one then explained it. Like, they were okay with you just completely... But I, but I didn't know. I, I think I never told anyone or said, like, you're not allowed to drink water and drive because then maybe they would have told me. I just honestly would felt like for years presumed that that's what it meant. Yeah. I guess it is a weird thing, like, when you explain drugs <laughs> and alcohol to your kids, right? I needed to explain when I was six. I guess so. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's not that even that story. embarrassing for you. That's mostly adorable. I Is think. it? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for fun.
funny. I'll give you like uh, a, for me the cringiest moment of of my life. It's embarrassing. I still think about it to this day and just like <laughs> die inside a little. When I was like maybe eight nine years old, and we went to the Kanata wave pool, wave pool just outside of Ottawa. It was super cool as a kid. Like the idea of going to Chuck E. Cheese or the Kanata or the wave pool was I, like had a wave pool. that was the shit, you know. Yeah. But anyway, I'm there. I guess we had some family in town. I go to the wave pool and it's right before I like we've been there for a while and it's closing and they're telling people to get out of the water and leave. And I, I guess I'm just sort of on autopilot. So like I'm there with my my brother's there too. And I think I'm following him. So I'm like walking behind him. And I walk into the change room and I turn the corner. And he turns around. It's not my brother. It's just some girl with short hair. And I look around and I'm in the women's change room, like right by the showers, and everyone just starts screaming. They scream? <laughs> oh, scream. Because there's, like, it was right by. I saw things a nine year old should not see. And I feel terrible about that. It was not intentional. It was entirely an accident. But, yeah. but yeah, like I still think about the the feeling, like the cringe of that moment is still with me to this day. <laughs> you know, I remember going to wave pools and just always being very surprised at how naked everyone was in the change room, like women and other young girls. Is that they a were difference? Just like they just didn't care. They're just walking around, and I remember feeling like this is weird and. I always went in a stall, personally. I think that's a generational thing too, right? Yeah, I, I think, think so. in change rooms today, people aren't just, or maybe it's a, a, a gender know. thing. I don't know. When I like go, when I was going to the gym a year or two ago, very few people are just getting completely naked and walking around change rooms. In my experience, anyway. Maybe it's different for kids, though. Yeah. Well, the, the kids thing too. There was always this awkwardness of like, if a parent has a child with them at a public pool. They're just bringing them into their change room. Yeah. And like, at what age is that not appropriate anymore? I, I don't know. When I have, I don't have comments because I'm not a parent. It's like a world I do not understand how to negotiate that issue. But uh, yeah. so you walked into the women's change room. I did. You were nine. Yeah. How did that feel? Yeah, I was. I was Cringe. I'm terrible. How? I feel so bad. You knew you were wrong immediately. When you realize there was women. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you know what? Like, like, some kid did the exact same thing I did. Well, some kid followed me, this other little boy. <laughs> so I turn around and like he's got this look on his face, like he's just what? his mind is just you exploding. <laughs> I was leading a parade in there apparently. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I remember walking into at some point in my life I've seen a men's bathroom. I don't really like <laughs> attach that to an incident, but I just sure. remember thinking at some point in my life what I noticed it because there were urinals and i was like what the fuck is that yeah because there's no urinals in the way <laughs> i remember seeing them maybe it was a family bathroom i don't know but i remember thinking what the fuck is that men pee in sinks that's disgusting <laughs> it is that is what it is in sinks it looked like a sink it's, it's just a low it's, sink it's just very convenient right but i guess you can't use it but it's not private like they're just open. Well, here I'll say I. <laughs> they should have like barriers between them. They most of them. Do it's not. it's weird when it's just like a flat wall of urinal. You know what I mean? So Isn't you walk up right next is? to people. Like how is it at work? There's a divider between oh, okay. them. Yeah, although it's way too close. You're basically shoulder to shoulder. You can hold it. So hands. like I get yeah you can hold it. <laughs> like, it's so weird. I'm, Are you guys being insane? I'm I'm pee shy. You know, if someone's right there, I can't. No, I, I can't go. So I'm just like awkwardly standing. Do you there. go in a stall or do you use the urinal? Well, it depends what I've got to do. <laughs> Say you're just peeing. Yeah. Do you go in the stall or no? Well, if the urinals are taken, I'll go in the so stall. So you prefer the urinal? It's being more, open. It's more convenient if it's open. Yeah. If there isn't someone right there, right? But like the risk is they could always open the door while you're peeing, and they could just see you. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. I do not want that. Shit happens, right? I've told this story before. Remember, I walked into a, a gas station bathroom that had a toilet and a urinal. Oh. And I went to the urinal, and then I realized there's a guy just sitting on the toilet <laughs> behind me. And you were an adult. <laughs> and I was an adult for that <laughs> so one. So you have childhood and adult embarrassing stories that are the same. I'm just walking into bathrooms that <laughs> I shouldn't be in all the time. I think we need to ban Ben. 
You know what's funny? There's a bar downtown Ottawa. It's, it's the mix, right? Where the signs on the doors, it doesn't say men or women. It's yeah. like the, uh, not, not the astrology sign. What's the word for it? But the symbol, like the print oh, symbol. The logo? Like the female logo. The <laughs> symbol that just says male or female, right? The gender uh, I'm like, keys. I don't know what, I don't know don't those symbols. No. What? Well, who cares? Why would I keep that in my brain? But like, it's like remembering, uh, like, uh, Sagittarius versus whatever <laughs> crystal thing, you know? No, it's not. <laughs> so yes. I've, I've definitely had Wait. to, like, open the door carefully Wait, and be like... Wait, this might possibly be the more embarrassing point. You don't know the difference between those gender symbols, like those icons, the one with the, the stick cross and then the one with the arrow at the end? Yeah, no, give me the, the <laughs> stick man or the stick woman. That's all I need. <laughs> Okay. Is that commonly used anymore? I mean, I, good point. I think today no one really uses those things, but I remember like people absolutely use those things for like washrooms and symbols. I think that the future is genderless bathrooms anyway. Yeah. Just give me a private place to just, do my business. Just let me be Please. in. Just give me a stall. I don't want sinks on the wall though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't want basically sinks on the wall that you pee in that I can see. Okay, this is a lot of bathroom talk. Okay. Do you have another? Are we another funny... <laughs> Do you want me to give another? I actually don't remember many. I don't really like even think of myself as like a person until I was a teenager. You know? Do you have any memories about? Were you a good student? That? Like school, as in like cartoon? You're not in school, but like a kid. When you're a kid, when you're being babysat in a location that they called school. <laughs> I mostly remember bouncing around schools, actually. So, uh... Because you're a problem Yeah, they get, get, I kept get getting the kicked out of school. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was, so I went to the first and second grade in Ottawa, here, at a French immersion school. It's really, like, to this day, I remember this woman. <laughs> don't, don't <laughs> Should I bleep out the name? But she was the kind of teacher who would, like, be so strict that like everyone would have to line up in alphabetical order, and if anyone made a noise, we wouldn't be allowed to go outside for recess. The same thing happened to me in French immersion. And you were in French immersion? Yeah. yeah. And this is, I feel like this is a French immersion. I remember Canadian having school friends system, right? who weren't in French immersion, they were just in regular English school, and they would like be shocked when I described to them what we had to do to, to, to line up for recess in alphabetical order. Like, you can't bounce a basketball or a Anyway, so that's my memory of like the first and second grade. But then my my dad took a job in Australia, and we all moved there. And yeah, I remember having a lot of trouble kind of settling in or adjusting to that. Right, and we only lived there two years before we moved back. And I remember so like uh, I met a friend there, uh, we hung out a bit. And I invited him over one day to watch a movie. And like, this is 1997, 1998, so I'm like nine years old. And somehow, my parents, I don't know if they let me or if the guy working at the movie store made a mistake, but we rented The Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> so two nine-year-olds walk out with that movie. And we go home and watch it, and his mom picks him up. And she calls my parents the next day being like, my son was like screaming all night from night terrors, and then we weren't allowed to hang out anymore. <laughs> well, what about you? Were you terrified? Or I guess I was fine. You know what's weird? My, my, my parents were like strict and overprotective, I would say, in weird ways. But then when it came to things like that, they were just like, I guess it didn't really regulate like the kind of media I was consuming, I guess. You just reminded me of something I did that's really crazy. Yeah? Lay it on me. We used to have sleepovers yeah. uh, with a bunch of girls from grade school, and you would prank call the boys in school. You remember prank calling? I remember. Like, it's really immature, uh, but people thought it was actually funny sure. for a time, especially if you were a child. <laughs> so everyone had each other's home numbers because no one has cell phones. But at home are your parents and other people who live in the house. However, we thought it was funny to pick up the phone and call boys in our school, and when no one answered, we would leave messages. <laughs> yeah. And because we were just so edgy, you know, 
We left messages with swear words because we thought. Because that's funny. Because that's funny. <laughs> and like, my memory of this isn't that there was any context of the swear word. Like, we weren't actually saying much other than just saying like, "love bitch." <laughs> Because it's just funny to do that. So we left messages on this poor boy. I'm not going to say his name, but I, I remember this particular situation. <laughs> because his his mother called a few of our parents uh. after this event and got really, really mad, <laughs> as they should. Because here we are. The well, how they track do they star 60? Like you can figure out who well, the call. This is when people had caller ID, so you could see. Uh, so they knew it was another girl's house we were having a sleepover at. Yeah. But they like figured it out. You know, like, people knew. <laughs> so I got in trouble, and my friends got in trouble, and there was a period where we couldn't have sleepovers because we left swear word messages on parents' phone. Like it's so stupid. <laughs> like it's not even this kid's phone. It's his parents, but like, we're not thinking. Yeah, were you that's often, really cringy. Were you often getting into trouble as a kid or not like, really? That was the extent of trouble as a, as a kid if you talk like, before I was a teenager, like that shit. Yeah, like me, I don't remember getting grounded or punished at all. Like in high school, in high school I was more yeah, rebellious. Yeah, sure. But and as I, a kid, prank calling. That's funny. Yeah, I guess the rebellious, you often get more rebellious in high school. But I also had older siblings who, uh, I guess sort of broke down some barriers for me, you know, my brother's four years older and my older sister too. I feel like they were held to a higher standard than I was, so by the time yeah, we high were. school rolled around, mm -hmm. you we were, were an older... Well, I remember, like, I don't know if we should share this, I remember uh, my brother's room was real messy. He was on the, he lived on, there was like a small room on our, in the attic of our house, which was my brother's room, and didn't even have a door, just some stairs to walk up there. I remember, like, my mom was always complaining about how messy his room was. I remember waking up one night, I guess I had already gone to bed, so it's like, you know, 10 p.m., 11, maybe I'm in, like, the 8th grade or something, and I just hear all this noise, and I walk out of my room, and my mom is just throwing my brother's stuff down the stairs. Time to move up? Like, just, just like, <laughs> breaking his shit. And, and we're, like, my sister comes out, and I'm out there, and we're, like, looking at her, and she's just, like, yelling about how messy his room is, and just, like, destroying his stuff. Like, Okay. What? It, where was your brother? I guess like I didn't have the frame of reference to know how like crazy that was at the time. But by the time I was a teenager and I had a messy room, that wasn't happening to me. Yes. Yeah. Parents are stricter usually when they're first born. Yeah. Yeah. I had the same experience, but I it mostly manifested in high school, so I probably mentioned this in other topics. I got grounded for things that like, my sister. Well, sure. I tried to go for parties and they were crazy like we yeah, ever trying to have a totally fine with my sister. You know, that, that, yeah. that's kind of the only thing. But yeah, so you were the youngest, you were the left of them. I guess so. So you never got in trouble at school? Because I remember getting in trouble at school for, not because I still to this day feel like I did anything wrong, but because times have changed and things that uh, weren't cool then it would be totally uncool of what happened to me today. <laughs> if it were to happen today. <laughs> Sorry, let, let me explain. So I remember being like 10, uh, a, a 10 year old girl, and wearing a, a thick tank top, like a tank top with thick straps. And I guess the, the size of the strap of the tank top is what determined whether or not it was against the dress code. It had to be a certain size, because you were allowed to wear a like, like thicker strap. Once because the boys could wear muscle tops. Oh. That's why. But if you were a girl, uh, the tank tops that are made are usually like the skinnier, slightly skinnier strap tank tops. We had to use strap tops. That's just what they were called. Um, sure. Anyways, I was like 10. I did not have boobs. Or it was not developed. Just just to, so you understand. Yeah. Um, and I was wearing a tank top that had somewhere in the middle of like spaghetti stop and it's spaghetti top strap and, and the, the thicker ones, so it was like an inch. And I got called out of the hallway by the principal, the principal of the entire school, so not just my teacher, and she said that what I was wearing was inappropriate and I would have to put on a sweater or my parents would be called. And I remember just crying in the hallway because I was shamed by being called out of the class in front of everyone. There's 30 students who turn their heads and say, 
All right. I'm going to let things dry and I'll be back. 